we are in Parashat Yitro, the highlight of the Torah, where we receive the Ten Commandments. We finally have the meeting between uh, God and us, where we are chosen to be a nation. All the rules of the Torah are given, uh, highlight of the Torah, one can say. And uh, in the entire Torah, we are summarized ten rules that kind of summarize the entire Torah, which is, of course, the Ten Commandments. And uh, if a person can guard the Ten Commandments, he's already in good shape. Many people tell me, ah, you know, keeping all the Torah is not so easy. And I always say, let's see you start with the Ten Commandments, then we'll, then we'll negotiate the next step. But nevertheless, there's one commandment there that is very uh, unusual, especially where we find it. And when you look in our generation, this is a very different generation from all the last thousands of years. That up until this generation, parents were on a pedestal. Now, kibud avem, it's a rare, rare mitzvah that you find. Now kids brush off their parents like as if they're, they owe them anything. 50 years ago, who would dare to talk in front of their parents? Who would dare to do anything in front of the parents? Sit in the father's seat, answer back to the mother, and so forth. Now, kids, they treat the parents like as if they owe them something. To a point that now, kids have rights, you can't scream at the kid, you can't hit the kid. Kids sue parents, kids uh, report their parents to social services, and so forth. So today I want to talk about specifically about the mitzvah of kibud orim, of honoring your parents, which is obviously found in the Ten Commandments. And what does it really mean to honor your parents? And how far do you need to go with honoring your parents? And what does the Torah define in honoring parents? And in order to start that, uh, I'm going to give two examples that are real. They're not uh, uh, made up. Two examples of somebody asked a rabbinical authority what to do. The first one is a girl that while she was a very young uh, child, her father left. Doesn't matter what or how, left, left her and her mom and was never there. Didn't raise her, didn't care for her, didn't support the mom, didn't come to any birthday, didn't send any birthday cakes, any birthday cards, didn't do anything. Didn't pay for tuition, nothing. Completely turned uh, his back against the girl. The girl did not have a father. Many years later, uh, she gets a phone call from her father. He's dying, he's on his deathbed, he's asking for forgiveness. He wants to ask for a mechila, for not being there all her life. And he says, I'm dying, I would want you to be next to me. And I'm definitely not going to call your mom, but uh, you are my flesh and blood. I want to... I wanna I want to have a relationship with you. And she calls a rabbi, it's a real story, I'm not making this up. What, do, what is my obligation to this man according to the Torah? Because I don't, I don't know him, I, I can stand him. Uh, he was never there for me. Now I need to uh, like him, I need to be with him, I need to... Pff, I, he's nothing for me. But what is my obligation from the Torah? Maybe the Torah is obligating me to do something. What is my obligation from the Torah in Kibbut Oh, Good timing. Okay. So, what is the foundation here, so to say, in the Torah? Do I owe him anything? Do I have to honor him? Do I have to do anything for this guy? Okay, this is first question. Second question is, of a woman, submitted a question to a rabbi, that her parents live nearby, and she wants to be nice to the parents, and every Shabbat she invites the parents to a Shabbat meal. But the whole meal, the mother is on her case, putting her down, insulting her, degrading her in front of the kids, complaining, all the, the whole meal. She's driving her nuts, and not only the whole meal, she's, the mother's just mistreating her in a very extreme way. And she's asking the rav, rabbi, do I have to invite her for Shabbat? She's ruining the Shabbat. It's not a Shabbat meal. It's not fun for me, not fun for the kids, not fun for anybody. I don't want to be next to this woman. Do I have to invite her for Shabbat? Do I have to call? Do, what do I have to do here with this woman that I, I can't stand? She's, she's driving me nuts. Okay? 
So the question is here, and this is a one case out of many, what is the obligation of the child towards the parents when the parents hurting the child? Does the child need to continue uh, uh, honoring the parents? Does the child need to turn around? What is the obligation of the child that the parents are mistreating the child? And, 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 and whatever type of situation, but that the parents are definitely not treating the child nice. Maybe abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, and so forth. What is the, the responsibility? What does the Torah tell the child to do in this situation? To stay, to leave, to ignore, to continue? So these are two questions that I ran into. That we're going to talk about it because this question comes a lot with many, many people. And everybody has their fair share with their parents. Now, the mitzvah of kibbuda ve'em, of honoring your parents, there's no any other mitzvah like this in the Torah. Nothing can compare to this mitzvah. It's a very unique mitzvah. And, you know, in this week we're getting the Ten Commandments. This is, I don't think that many people realize the highlight. This is the highlight of the Torah. This is when we were given the Torah. I mean, up until then, Abraham Avinu, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Yosef, and so forth, they fulfilled the Torah, but it was never given. So many mitzvot were done before that, but they were not commanded. Abraham Avinu circumcised himself. Abraham Avinu used to, used to do Iruv uh, Hatzerot, but the Torah was never given. Now we finally get the Torah, and what a production. We think it's a bunch of uh, people and some cows in the desert and some smoke. If there was ever any a way to do a special effects, a movie, to show how it was really, this is not something that it's so easy for us to fathom. But nevertheless, the Torah is given, everybody sees this wondrous occasion, not only the Jews, the nations are there, everybody's there. Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to the mountain, comes down, ooh, a whole show. But after 40 days that Moshe is in the mountain, he comes down with two tablets. The famous story, Everybody is picturing the idea, is holding the two tablets. All the pictures, by the way, or I should correct myself, 99% of the pictures that you see are completely not accurate because the, the tablets were not rounded on the top, like you see in most synagogues. It's not correct. The tablets were a rectangle. Moshe is holding the tablets like as if it's an iPad. It's not. The tablets were six amot high. They were almost two meters high. They were huge. But nevertheless, we're not going to get into the technical part of the tablets. Moshe is coming down with two tablets. Now comes a very big question in the commentaries, why two? Why not one? Why not three? So I'm not now talking about the joke when it's uh, free, give me two. I'm not talking about the famous joke. I'm not really going to say it again because I said this joke already a hundred times. But why two tablets? Our sages explain to us that the reason why it's two tablets is to separate the two groups of mitzvot. The first five, the right tablet, is all the mitzvot between me and God. Ben Adam Lamakom. I am going to be your only God, don't believe in any other gods, don't worship idols and so forth. It's all the mitzvot between me and the Kadosh Bucho, Ani Hashem Elokecha and so forth. The other set of the, tab the mitzvot, the, the left tablet, is the five mitzvot between me and another person. Ben Adam Lechavero. Very interestingly that if you notice the five mitzvot, the five commandments on the right one, on the right tablet, every mitzvah has Hashem's name in it. Ani Hashem Elokecha. Not said Hashem Elokim Lashav. But on the five mitzvot, the five commandments on the left one, there's not the name of Hashem. Not Tirzach. Don't kill. Not Tinaf. Don't commit adultery. It doesn't say Hashem's name there. So we see one set of tablets is mitzvot between me and Hashem. The second one is between me and another person. And the reason, our sages say the reason why in the first five there's Hashem's name and the other five there's not Hashem's name, to show us that the first five are a little bit more important. They're a little bit higher. It's between me and Hashem, not between me and another person. Now comes a big question. Why is honoring your parents in the first five? That's between me and another person. It's not between me and Hashem. This is commandment number five. And it's on the right side. That should, should be a mitzvot between me and Hashem. Why is honoring your parents on the first set? Now, what is the Torah trying to tell me here? Because it's now confusing me. If it's a mitzvah between me and another person, me and my parents should be on the left side. So there'll be four and six. It doesn't work symmetrically. Or, or, I mean, even though Hashem can do whatever He wants. But nevertheless, if the Torah already divided the mitzvot into two tablets, 
and one tablet is between me and Hashem, and one tablet between me and another person, and the kibud av and M is on the right side with me, between me and Hashem, and the Torah is trying to teach me something here. So there's a famous story with the, the Caesar of Rome, Andrianos, and he was a very good friend of Rabbi Hanina. Uh, Rabbi Hanina was not only that he was a great sage, he was a, a politician, very big speaker, had friends in the Roman Senate, would mingle with the, with the Caesars and so forth. And Andrianus was a good friend of him. And one time they have a, a conversation, and Andrianus was uh, always throwing to him questions about the Torah. And it says, he asks him, how come in the tablets, in the two tablets, when Hashem is talking to you, you Jews, because the first five tablets are mainly for the Jews, how come Hashem is mentioning his name there? And on the other set of the tablets, where the may, all the mitzvot are also for all mankind, Hashem is not having his name there. Because lo tirzach, lo tinaf, lo tignov, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal. That's for everybody. Not only the Jews, for all the nations. But, I am God, your God that took you out of Mitzrayim. That's only for the Jews. And to observe Shabbat, commandment number four, that's only for the Jews. That's only for the Jews. So Andriano says, okay, I respect that, that the first five is for the Jews, and the other five is for all the nations. But how come in the first five there is Hashem's name? When Hashem is talking to you, you Jews, and when Hashem is talking to all the world, He doesn't have His name there. Why? Okay, so Rabbi Hanina is a... a, a He's a politician. No need to get into confrontation right now. He has to give him a very diplomatic answer. So he says, listen, it doesn't uh, fit well that Hashem will put his name with murderers. Lot irtzach. Lot inaf. Don't commit a doubt. Uh, it doesn't seem nice that you, boy, Hashem wants to put his name with a murderer. Hashem will put his name with a, 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 somebody who commits adultery. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't resonate well. And he says, look at that, when you're going in the street in any type of kingdom, then the kings, or the Caesars, or the emperors, there's statues of them all over the streets. Is there a statue of the emperor in the bathroom? No, you're not going to put a statue of the Caesar in the bathroom. No, it doesn't fit well. So Hashem doesn't put his name in these mitzvahs where it doesn't look good to be with a murderer. You know, for us, what do we take from that? We don't put a mezuzah in the toilet. Why? It's not Patim, it's not the right way. You don't put Hashem's name in the door of the toilet. You put it on any other door, but you don't put it in the bathroom. So Rabbi Hanina gave him a very diplomatic answer to shut him up. A commentary called Kli Akar says that was an excuse to shut him up. But this is not the real truth. I mean, Rabbi Hanina didn't want to start a whole uh, an argument here. The Kli Akar says, no, 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 he just said it to shut him up. Really? Hashem wanted to separate the two mitzvot. The two groups. One group is Ben Adam Lamakom, between me and Hashem. So Hashem puts his name there and he makes a clear separation. And the other group is between me and another person. So Hashem says, no, I'm going to put my name in there. So again, comes the question, how come Kibuda Ve'em is in the right side, in the first five? This is a mitzvah between one person and the other. How is Hashem in there? The halacha compares honoring your parents to honoring God. That's brought down into halacha. The fact that you have to honor your God, you have to honor your parents. That's it, clear halacha. And the halacha says that all the laws that I had between me and Hashem apply to between me and, God and my parents. That's to halacha. We have to go by halacha. We don't go by any other source. Some people invent also inventions. They go only by the written Torah. Some people say I only go by what the Gemara says. This is not correct. We have halacha. We have the oral law, that's what we go by. And the halacha says all the rules that apply between me and Hashem, they apply between me and, and, and my parents. End of story. Now, why is that? Do you argue with Hashem? No. Are you allowed to argue with Hashem? No. So don't argue with the parents. Are you allowed to contradict or question Hashem? No. So don't contradict and question your parents. Very simple. This is how far the halacha goes with it. Don't, don't uh, separate the two. Now, there are numerous stories, we can make a series of stories in the Talmud about Kibud Avem and uh, about how many stories of sages what they did. So we'll just choose a few of them. 
There is a story in the Talmud, can be found in Tracted Kiddushin, with Rabbi Tarfon. I'm sure you're familiar with Rabbi Tarfon. Rabbi Tarfon was one, one of Rabbi Akiva's friends. And soon is Pesach, we're going to read the Haggadah. It's referring to Rabbi Tarfon a few times. He's one of the ones who survived, one of the few who led the, the nation. He was a friend of Rabbi Akiva. He was a, a, a tzeetza, an offspring of Ezra Cohen. Nevertheless, a great sage. And it says that one time his mother was very, very old. He was old, so his mother was very old. And he used to go to walk with her and take her everywhere. And it says that one time on Shabbat he goes on a walk with her and her shoe rips and she can't step on the floor. And you can't fix the shoe on Shabbat. You don't have to fix it. What does he do? He bends down and he puts his feet, his hands on the ground and she steps on his hands till they come home. He can't carry her. So he puts his hands on the ground and she, ste he's, she steps on his hands. And his mother the next day goes to the yeshiva and she tells the students, you've got to give him a bracha. You've got to give him a blessing to have a long life. I mean, when you're reading in the Torah about the mitzvah of kibbud aven, leman yarichun yamecha, that you're, you do the mitzvah of kibbud aven, you're going to gain a long life. She tells the students, you got to give him a blessing so he should have a long life. My little, my little uh, uh, boy. So they said, no, we, we don't know, no, no. We don't want to give him this blessing. She says, why? That's not nice to talk like this about your Rebbe. He's your teacher, he's your master. You don't want to give him a blessing. So they said, if, if this is his tikkun, <laughs> his rectification to do kibbut avem, and he did it so amazing, then he will die because he did his tikkun. We don't want him to die. So we don't want to like, consider this like a great mitzvah. Right? They want, they're thinking of themselves. They said, we don't want him to die. But nevertheless, this is one story out of many of what an extent of kibbut avem. The reason, I mean, I, I forgot to mention that the, the reason why they said we don't want to give him the blessing, this is brought down by the Rebbe from Kotsk that explained that he didn't, they didn't want him to fulfill, to con be considered like as if they f he fulfilled the mitzvah so good because once you reach your tikkun, you die. So they said we don't want him to die. So let's say this is not really kibbut avem. Eh, it's okay, he just bent his, his, his body. <coughs> But nevertheless, this is one example, one story out of many in the Talmud. But there's also many stories about also Gentiles that did unbelievable kibbutz avem. It's not only in the Jews. There's a story about a certain individual. His name is Dama Benetina. This story is found in the Talmud, but in the Yerushalmi, specifically in Masechet Kiddushin. And it says there a story that the, a group of the sages, they lost one of the stones of the breastplate of the heaven of Nea Hoshen. Ooh, this is uh, not something to lose. Where did I put this stone? Oh my God. So, they didn't know what to do. They start asking around, how are we going to get a replacement? They find out that there's a certain individual, a Gentile. His name is again Dama Benetina, and he has a stone like that. They come to him and they tell him, listen, we have a problem. We cannot find one of the stones of the breastplate. This is, what are we going to do? We, we, we heard you have one. He says, yeah, it's correct, I have one. They said, we will give you whatever you want. He says, okay, the price is X amount of money. No problem. Go get it, please. He says, I can't get it to you right now. Come back later. Come back later? What do you mean, come back later? We need it right now. He says, no, I can't give it to you right now. And they said to him, why? So he says, because it's in the safe. Okay, so go to the safe, we'll take you. He says, I can't, the keys to the safe is under my, the pillow of my father and my father is taking a nap. I can't wake him up for that. Now they thought it's a negotiation system, like he's pretending, so they says, we'll give you double. He says, I don't need double. I will not wake up my father from his nap to open the safe, you gotta wait. So thinking that it's a negotiation sta sta a tactic, they told him, we'll give you triple. Just go and open the safe. <laughs> no, I am not waking up my father. He's napping now. When he wakes up, I'll take the keys. I'll open the safe. I'll give you the stone. A few hours pass. The father wakes up. He opens the safe. He gives him the stone. They come to give him three times the amount. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to make more money on the kibbutz avem. You give me exactly the amount that I told you in the beginning. The sages have gave him a blessing because they were so impressed by the kibbutz avem and the fact that he didn't want to use them and cheat them, they gave him a blessing, a blessing that he should have in his f backyard, he had a little farm, that he should have a red heifer. I mean, we had nine red heifers 
uh, during the time of Beit HaMikdash. The first one was in the desert, of course. But then during the time of Beit HaMikdash, we had another eight red heifers. And now we're missing only one. We had up until now nine. When Mashiach comes, we have the tenth one. We already have a few candidates of red heifers. One was in Oklahoma, another one in New Jersey. They brought one of them to Israel. But nevertheless, they gave him a blessing that he should have a red heifer because they knew this is a priceless thing. And there's even the guy now in uh, New Jersey that uh, has a red heifer and they offered him a million dollars. And he says, I'm not, I don't want money for that. You take it for free. I, I, he end, this is the Gentile. He's like, I don't need uh, the Machon HaMikdash. There's an organization that they're preparing everything for Beta Mikdash. They know all the halachot. They know how, how everything has to be. They told him, we'll pay you a million dollars. He's like, I don't want nothing. I'm giving you the, the cow. They just didn't know how to, re to transport it to Israel because it can't can have any blemish. All it needs is to fall one time and that's it. It's not kosher. So, but nevertheless, they gave him a blessing that he should have a red heifer. And this is one, one story out of many. And again, to show that the, the, the honoring the parents is not only for the Jews, it's for everybody. Also, the Gentiles have to honor their parents. And there is another story with this Dhamma that he was, a, he was a politician. He was like in the Senate. He was one of the head masters at the time. And one time in the middle of the council, there's a meeting, his mother was old and a little bit uh, cuckoo. Mm -hmm. And uh, she walks into one of the uh, meetings and she takes off her shoe and she starts hitting him in front of everybody. And this is like uh, hitting a, I don't know, a Knesset member, a Senate, a, a, big, a big, big shot. And as she was hitting him with the shoe, the shoe fell off her hand and fell on the floor. So he bent down, picked up the shoe, and gave it to her back so she can continue hitting him. So nevertheless, you see here the extent of Kibbutz Avem, and this is by, by a Gentile, not a Jew. So this is two examples out of many in, that we find in the Talmud about the extent of Kibbutz Avem. Rambam says that Kibbutz Avem is equivalent to fearing Hashem. This is how high this mitzvah is. Why? Why do we compare our parents to Hashem? Why do I do that? So there are two explanations that I, I found, and this is what we want to take from this, uh, from this class. One of them is brought down by Sefer HaChinuch. The other one is brought down by the Ramban. Two ideas that we want to take from. The first one is brought by Sefer HaChinuch. About 200 plus years ago, there was a certain individual known as Rabbi Yonatan Ivshitz. Ivshitz, Ivshitz. He was the rabbi of Prague, chief rabbi of Prague. Needless to say, what a pillar in Jewish history. And he, in the beginning, was a rabbi of a little town. But very quickly, he was known to be something extraordinary. And at some point, he gets an invitation to come and become the rabbi, the chief rabbi of Prague. Now, this is becoming, you know, what an upgrade, a little town, and then uh, they call him to be the chief rabbi of Prague. Okay, the, the messengers come, they give him the offer, and he says, uh, let me think about it. He didn't jump on the opportunity right away. He says, give me a few weeks. In our days, if a rabbi will get an uh, invitation from being a chief rabbi of a shul with 12 people to suddenly become the, the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim or something big, three seconds is already there. This rabbi says, no, no, give me a couple of weeks, let me, let me think about it. Okay, they come back after a couple of weeks. During the time that he tell them, let me wait a couple of weeks, he, everybody, of course, in the town knew that that's the offer, that their rabbi is, uh, got an offer to go to Prague. Nothing happened. There was no questions, no demonstrations, no asking, no big, nothing. Business as usual. A few weeks later, the messengers come. No, did you accept the invitation? Yes, I will come to be the chief rabbi of Prague. Good, pack your bags. He tells them, why don't you wait a few days? It will take me some time to pack. Wait a few days. Okay, during these few days, the messengers that came to take him from Prague, they're waiting and waiting. A few days pass, another few days pass. At some point, they're telling him, Habibi, eh, with all due respect, yeah, chief rabbi, but we need to go back. They're waiting for us. We have families, we have jobs to do. He tells them, you, you wait, 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 wait a little bit more. I need a few, few more days. 
Finally, after a couple of days, he decides to call the people from the town into a meeting. He puts everybody in the shul. He stands on the podium and he starts talking. I know you all know that I was offered to be the chief rabbi of Prague and I accepted the, the, the job. I will be leaving today and I wanted to give you a farewell uh, a speech. And he starts telling them, I hope that tomorrow when I leave, you will stay always the same. And he starts telling them one thing after the other. I hope that you will continue eating kosher meat. I hope you will continue slaughtering the animals, how we used to do it, how we do it, and salting the meat. And I hope you're going to not steal, and I hope you're not going to desecrate Shabbat. And he's giving them half an hour, one halacha after the other, what he's hoping they're not going to do. At some point, the Gabai says, excuse me, Kevodo, your honor, but what, you don't trust us? You've been a rabbi for years. Oh, what do you think? The second you're going to leave, we're going to start robbing and stealing and not eating kosher and not uh, going to the mikveh. Well, 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 where is it coming from? So he tells them, yes, I am worried. I'm actually scared for you. And they're like, what do you mean you're scared for us? Like, wh why would you be scared for us? So he says, I don't know what's going to happen when I leave. And they don't understand. What do you mean? He tells them the whole time that I served you, I was your chief rabbi for years, decades. Every question you had, I answered. You came knocking on my door day and night. I taught you. I inspired you. I gave. I married you all. I did circumcisions. I did everything for you. I was devoted to this community. I, did, I gave my life to this community. A few weeks ago, you heard that I got a different job and I'm leaving. Not one of you came to me and told me, please stay. You are our rabbi. Why are you leaving? Is it money? You need a bigger gear salary? We'll get you the money. Is it status? You don't get enough respect? Why are you leaving us? Please don't leave us. You are our rabbi for years. Why were you, were you taking a bigger job for us? He says, not even one of you came to thank me, to ask me to stay, to give me a, any farewell greetings. Nothing. So he says, a kfuy tova. Somebody who's not thankful, something that somebody that doesn't have any type of appreciation to what I did here, very quickly you're going to go off the derech. Very quickly you're going to go off the Torah. And he says, somebody who's ungrateful, I don't believe in them. I have no faith in them. I don't trust in them. Somebody who's ungrateful, because if you're ungrateful with me today, tomorrow you're going to be ungrateful with Hashem. Sorry to tell you. That's, that's why I'm telling you, I hope you're not going to steal. I hope you're going to continue slaughtering the animal. Uh, kosher slaughtering. I hope and I hope and I hope. Because you're all ungrateful. Not even one of you came to say thank you or any type of nice warming word. And he says there's something that is one of the most powerful things in the Torah. The root of all the bad characteristics, midot raot, in the human being is when a person is ungrateful. Kfiyut tova. Don't even know how to appreciate them. Somebody who's un unappreciative and ungrateful. But the root of all the good midot in the Tova, all the good c characteristics and the attributes is hakarata Tova. Is appreciating that somebody did something good to you. If you appreciate that somebody, that somebody did something good to you, this is the root of all the good midot. And he says, and this is why kibud avem, the honoring the parents, is on the right side. On their five first uh, commandments. Why? Because that's the protection that we're going to be loyal to Hashem. You are loyal to your parents, you're going to be loyal to Hashem. You're going to be grateful to your parents, you're going to be grateful to Hashem. This is called Hakarat Tov. Somebody did something good to you, acknowledge it. Thank them. Be appreciative, even if it's 20 years ago. It doesn't matter. Somebody did something to you, you went out of the way for you, be, be grateful. This is called Hakarat Tov. And you know what? If you do that Hakarat Tov, and you're grateful to your parents, you're always going to be grateful to Hashem. You're always going to stay a good Jew. And if you're not, I have no faith. And he says here one of the most powerful things, if we have to take something out of this class, and Bechlal, he says, Kfuy tova, ozevet Hashem. Somebody who's ungrateful, eventually will leave Hashem. If you see a person that his attitude is being ungrateful, at some point he will also leave Hashem. He's not going to stick with Hashem ever.
So this is the idea behind what the Sefer HaChinuch says, that how much is Hashem doing good to us? Look around you, how much good is Hashem doing to you? Giving you life, giving you food, giving you parnasah, giving you teeth to eat, giving you feet to walk on. You have to be thankful. Now, the story that I heard not too long ago, that it's unbelievable. This is, this is where you see how Hashem rewards somebody that is thankful. Most people, unfortunately, are not so thankful. People do so many things for them, and they like just brush it up, they, they owe you, like you see, you owe you something. There's a story that I heard not too long ago about a kosher plant in, the, in America. And was a big, a big butcher, I don't know if to call it a butcher or a kosher plant, where they used to slaughter all the animals. Nevertheless, every day trucks will come there to pick up all the meat. And of course, who would come there would be Orthodox Jews coming to pick up the meat, to distribute it. One, and of course, I don't know if you ever uh, saw the kosher plants, they come very early in the morning, two, three in the morning, all take all the meat out of the refrigerators. Okay, one time, the group, there was about uh, 40 drivers that always would come, they all drive out. As they drive out, the guard tells them, wait a minute, there's one guy missing. They're telling him one guy's missing. Yeah, he says, one of your drivers is missing. They're like, whoa, they look around, what do you know? They met one of the guys is missing. They go back into the plant and they find one of the drivers stuck in the refrigerator. He went in to get some of the meat, the door closes, closed on him. If he would stay there a few more hours, he would freeze to death. Now they have buzzers inside, they have how to open it inside. But this was a long time ago. And they of course took the driver out and he comes to the guard and he says, you saved my life. I mean, if you wouldn't notice it, I will freeze to death. He's, he's like, to what do I owe this thanks? How did you remember me even? I mean, we all look the same. The beard and the yarmulke and the, the black suit. How do you tell the difference between us? He says, your thanks and your concern to me was missing. You are the only one that every morning that you walked in, you said, good morning. And you're the only one that every time you went out, you said, thank you. You acknowledge that I exist. You acknowledge that I'm part of the system, that without the guard, you know, the system doesn't work well. He says, you're the only one. So I noticed that you were missing when you went out. I didn't get my good night. I didn't get my thank you. So this is where you see how Hashem rewards somebody that is thankful, that is appreciative. He saved his life. So this is, again, one example out of many, but... There's a very interesting commentary, but by a commentary, but it's not a commentary, it's a great Rebbe. He's called, he's known as the Sfat Emet. Sfat Emet is a very famous Rabbi, Rabbi Ari Leb Alter. He was the first Rebbe of the Hasidut of Gur. Unbelievable uh, uh, individual, great tzaddik. He's known as the Sfat Emet. That's his, uh, his uh, nickname. Anyways, he says, how come if Kibbut Avem is such a great mitzvah, you don't say a blessing on it? You put filin, asher kichalu mitzvotav v'tzivanu l'anech tefilin. I eat bread, asher kichalu mitzvotav v'tzivanu al netilat yadayim. Why don't I say a bracha, asher kichalu mitzvotav v'tzivanu al kibbud orim? Why don't I say a bracha? Then he takes it another step forward, which is another interesting question, out of context here, but he says, why don't we say a bracha before we read the Haggadah, the Haggadah of Pesach? I mean, it's a mitzvah. Why don't we say, asher kichalu mitzvotav v'tzivanu l'kroot Haggadah Pesach? We don't say that. But nevertheless, He's asking, why don't we say a blessing when we have to do kibbud avem? So he answers and he says, our sages wanted uh, honoring your parents to be spontaneous. Not because I'm uh, uh, commanded. You know why I put fillin in the morning? Because I was commanded to put that. There are days that I don't want to put fillin on. But I still put it because Hashem commanded me to do it. And I don't want to transgress the commandment of Hashem. And not me, many men. They don't want to put fillin on today. I'm busy. I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'm occupied. My Yetzirah is out of control. Don't want to put filin on today. But I still do it. Because it's a commandment. The Sfat Emet says the reason why we don't have a bracha for Kibbut Avem because he doesn't, Chazal didn't want us to do it because we're commanded to do it. He says, I want you to do it because you want to do it. If this would be a straight out commandment with a mitzvah, you would want to say, okay, I have to do it because it's a commandment, not because I want to honor my parents. So... <clears throat> With that said, comes another big question. We just left Mitzrayim last week. And it says, Vachamushim alu Bnei Yisrael mi Mitzrayim. 
The nation of Israel left armed swords, weapons. I mean, we know they, have, they had weapons. They fought Amalek. How did they have uh, weapons to fight Amalek? How did they even have an army? How did they have training to fight Amalek? Obviously, they had an army. Obviously, they had weapons. Obviously, they were pre prepared. So how come they didn't fight the Egyptians? Why didn't, you, why, why didn't they make a U-turn and fight the Egyptians? They were scared. No, we don't want to go. They're coming. Why couldn't they fight them? So the answer is Hakaratatov. They had appreciation. Because 210 years prior to that, when 70 people needed green cards, the Egyptians accepted them. They took them into the land. They gave them a place to live. Yeah, Paro uh, tortured them for 210 years. But nevertheless, they didn't forget the tov that they did to them 210 years ago. We can't fight them. And we know where we see it again? With Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't strike the water in the plague of blood. Why? Hakarat Atov. Was thankful and grateful for the Yor, that the Yor saved him. I mean, the Yor is an anonymous. It's water. The Yor really saved him. But nevertheless, Moshe says, he did, it didn't drown me. It didn't do anything. I'm not going to strike it. Aaron, you, you hit the water. So, the first explanation, what I said, is based on the uh, on the Sefer HaChinuch, and like I said, this is the, the this Hakarat Atov. And this is in itself, we can end the class here about Hakarat Atov, because majority of people don't have Hakarat Atov. They know that Hakarat Atov means that you are appreciative that somebody did something good to you. Most people think it like as if you owe them anything. So this is in itself, a class in itself, this is a standalone class, how much important it is to be thankful and grateful for every person that does something to you, even 40 years ago. Somebody did something good to you? Appreciate it. But nevertheless, there's another opinion, another uh, way of looking at it. This is brought down by the Ramban, not Maimonides, rather Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. And he has another, another way of looking into it. There is a story in the Talmud about Eliyahu Navi, when he was still a human, flesh and blood. And there's a story that he once he met Achav. And Achav was a very uh, uh, wicked individual. And uh, uh, he confronted Eliyahu Navi and says, you know, your Torah is nonsense. It's bobkes. It's all nonsense what it says in the Torah. And you know why? It says in the Torah that if you go in the laws of Hashem, that I will give you, I will give you rain. And I will give you parnasa and sustenance. And Achav says, you know what? Look at me and Izevel. We turn the entire Shomron into an idol worship area. Everybody's worshiping idol, idols here. We turned everybody to idol worshippers. We're doing everything against Hashem. And look at us. Rain all the time. Prosperity. Everything that we want, we have. So uh, the Torah is one big hoax. It says that if you don't follow Hashem, nothing will happen. You see, obviously you have, look how much rain we have. And we're idol worshippers. Eliyahu Navi says, oh yeah? No problem. Eliyahu and Avi made a decree that there shouldn't be any rain. And Eliyahu and Avi decided and there wasn't any rain for three years. Famine. Now we do know, based on the Talmud, that there are three keys that the Kadosh Buchu doesn't give to anyone. Three keys that Hashem doesn't share. He holds the keys. One key is rain. Hashem controls the rain. He will control who will get the rain, when and how and what. The next key is Tchiyat Amitim, resurrection of the dead. Nobody can resurrect the dead unless Hashem gives them the key. And the third one, it's called Leida, giving birth. Hashem controls who's going to have a child, who's not going to have a child. These are the three keys that Hashem is holding on his keychain, like this, and he decides who gets the keys. But these are the keys that Hashem doesn't give to anybody. So Eliyahu Navi got very upset at Achav, and he says to Hashem, give me the key of rain. I want to control the rain. Hashem says, okay, no problem, my dear servant. Here's the keys. Now you control the rain. Three years, there wasn't any rain. Now, as a result, there was a big famine. As a result, Eliyahu Navi also suffered from that because he didn't have what to eat. So the story says that he went to this uh, woman, Haisha Tzorefet. Long story short, he was staying there. She fed him, and at some point, her son died. Her little son died. She turned to Eliyahu Navi and says, my son died. Can you make a miracle? Can you resurrect him? Eliyahu Navi says, no problem. I'm Eliyahu Navi. He goes to Hashem. Hashem, I need the next set of keys for Tchiyat Ametim, for resurrecting the dead. Hashem says, whoa, whoa, Eliyahu. 
I can't have a human having more keys than me. There are three keys. I always have to have at least two. I can't have that a human will have two keys and I have one key. So give me back the keys for the rain. I'll give you the key for Tchiat Metim, but you give me back the keys for the rain. So Liao Navi wanted to help this lady, so he gives Hashem back the key for the rain. Here's the key for the rain. And right away, the sun wakes up. Tchiat Metim. But the second that the sun wakes up, rain starts coming down. The whole thing didn't work well. Anyways, the rain starts coming down, and all because that the Kadosh Baruch told him, give me back the keys for the rain. Now, very interestingly, in Hebrew, key is mafteach. You write mafteach, mem, pei, taf, chet. This is the acronym of the three things that the Kadosh Baruch is holding. Mem is matar, rain. Pei is parnasa, which is matar is parnasa. I mean, you have rain, you have parnasa. Taf is tchiyat ametim, and chet is chaya veleida, giving birth. So the word ki holds in it the acronym of the things that the Kadosh Baruch is holding. Rambam says, the Ramban, that the third ki is giving birth, leida. Shem decides who's going to give birth and who's not. And when a parent gives birth to a child, they got the key. Just imagine how many parents get the key to give a, to have, to give a child, to, get, to bear a child. It means the Kadosh Baruch gave the parents the key. I trust you. You know how many people get these keys? These are my keys. See? Not a lot of people get my keys. It's my keys. I don't want to give my keys. You're going to lose it. You're going to misplace it. You can open my drawers. Kadosh Baruch says, I'm giving you a key. I'm giving you the key to bring a child to the world. The parents got a key. They're partners with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. The Ramban says the parents become creators. They become partners with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. They have the key to bring a child to the world. This is not something to, to ignore. Now the parents become partners to Hashem. So when you are fresh to your parents, you answer back, you answer back to Hashem. You go against your parents, you go against Hashem. This is uh, not a th light thing to take to, to wait a minute. <laughs> I'm doing something against my parents. I'm doing it against Hashem. That's partners. If you are my partner and somebody goes against you, you're going against me. Sorry to tell you. That's how it works. There's a story in the Torah about Pinchas. We'll take a few more months till we get to him. But Pinchas was very upset with Zimri. Zimri went with a, a woman called Kosbi. And he had uh, relations with her in front of everybody. It says that Pinchas got very pff, upset, took his sword and pff, put them both on them on the sword like a skewer. He killed them. And it says, Kina lokav. Pinchas was jealous to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Because Pinchas could not bear the fact that the power of giving birth was desecrated. Instead of taking this power and bringing a child to the world, it was used to go to mock Hashem. Yeah, he couldn't take it. So, we see the power, what it means of a parent giving uh, life to the child. Now, there's a story in the Talmud. This can be found in Tracted Kiddushin with Rav Yosef. And it says over there that every time that he would hear the footsteps of his mom, he would get up right away. They told him, why are you getting up? He says, I hear the footsteps of the Shekhinah. Shekhinah is the feminine aspect of the divine. He would get up right away. And needless to say, how many stories we find in the Talmud, how the sages were so into the Kibbud Avem. Now, now let's, with all this said, let's summarize what we learned here. Because what we learned here is some pretty profound message what the Torah has to tell me. But now let's go back to these two questions that we asked before. Okay, now I understood the Torah wants me to be grateful and thankful to my parents. And the Torah is also telling me, hey, you have to honor your parents. They gave you birth. They gave you life. They're partners with Hashem. So we have two profound messages here. Now let's go back to the questions that are pretty much common between everybody. What about the first girl that her father was not around all her life? Didn't pay for tuition, didn't send birthday cards, didn't do anything. And then he wants to ask for forgiveness. And then uh, he, she wa he wants him to, her to be around. This is called Hakarata Tov, being grateful. Now, what am I going to be grateful for? He didn't do anything. 
You didn't raise me, you didn't support me, you didn't do anything to me. So what, what do I need to be grateful about? So there's no hakarat tov here. I don't have to be great, uh, appreciative. You didn't do anything. So what, what is the answer here? So if she's already doing kibura vehem, it's just because of the fact that he's her father. She, there's no hakarat tov here. There's no appreciation. You didn't do nothing to me. If she does uh, kibbut avim in this case, it's only because he still gave her birth. He still gave her life. You know, there's a commentary by the Katav Sofer. The Katav Sofer is the son of the Khatam Sofer. And he says something very, very interesting. This parasha, we're going to read about the Ten Commandments. But also in Parashat Et Hanan, we read about the Ten Commandments. This we're going to read in, in the summer. There is a many questions why do we read the Ten Commandments twice. First in Yitro and then in Parashat Et Hanan. But nevertheless, this is a lot, a lot of answers why we read it twice. But the Katab Sofer says, did you notice that when we're reading the Ten Commandments in Et Hanan, it's a little bit different? It's not 100% the same. There's a few words that are changed there. And in the mitzvah, in the commandment of Kibbut Avem, it adds a few words. And it says, Ka'asher Tziviticha. Kashir Tzivicha, sorry. You should honor your parents like as I commanded you. We're not going to read this, this Shabbat. It's not in Nitro, it's only in Netchanan. Why? The answer is that it says in the Parashat Netchanan, Kashir Tziviticha be Mara. When the Kadosh Baruch gave the commandment of Kibbut Avem was in Mara. Mara was right in the beginning when they left Egypt. We, re we read that last week. What does it mean, Kasher Tziviticha? When they left Egypt, did they have anything to be grateful to Hashem? To, the, to their parents, sorry? Their parents were slaves. They didn't give them toys. They didn't give them food. They didn't give them anything. Who gave them everything? Okay. Only Hashem. Only Hashem gave them. So why would they have to be thankful to the parents? So Hashem says, because I commanded you then. I commanded you, so you still have to have Kibbut Avem. So it has nothing to do with Hakarat Atov. It has nothing to do with being grateful to your parents. The kibbutz avem. The kibbutz avem has to do the fact because the parents gave you life, because the parents that bear bore the, the, the gave life to the kids in Mitzrayim. They didn't give them anything besides life. So this is just a commentary about the Khatam Sofer, Sofer. So comes the conclusion. So why do I need to honor my parents? Why do I need to honor my parents now? If they didn't do anything to me, like the case with this young girl, my father didn't do anything. Why should I honor him? So Hashem says you honor your parents. Because they gave you life. Because they brought you to the world. End of story. It has nothing to do with Hakarat Atom. It has nothing to do with the fact that they did anything good to you. So this is in regards to this girl that was asking, what should I do with the father? The answer that she got, you still give kibbut, you still do kibbut avem. So what if he didn't do anything? You do your mitzvah. Because he brought you to this world. Now has the other question that is more applicable to us. How about the woman that the mother is driving her crazy? That she's going down to her life. She's insulting her, going against her, making her upset, making her life miserable and so forth. This is a real question that a woman asked the rabbi, what should I do with her mom? There is a story in the Talmud about a certain Amora. His name is Rav Asi. He had an older mother and his older mother at some point got a little bit, uh, a little bit cuckoo and she started driving him crazy. Bring me this, bring me that, do for me this, do for me that. She was driving him nuts. And at some point, she told him, buy me jewelry. I want beautiful jewelry. He says, I don't have money, I'm a, I'm a scholar. Buy me jewelry. He went, raised money somehow, bought a jewelry. At some point, she told him, I want you to marry up. I want you to find me a man, I want to get married. Well, you're like 92 years old, who am I going to get you to, to marry? So he found some guy from the old age house. He didn't even barely even see anything. He got a marriage. She says, no, I don't want him. I want somebody young and handsome like you. How am I going to get you that? She was driving him completely crazy. <laughs> At some point, he went to his rabbi and told him, what am I going to do with this woman? She's driving me nuts. His rabbi told him, go to Eretz Israel. He lived in Babylon. He says, go to Eretz Israel. Move away. Run away from her. You have nothing to do. Don't answer back. Don't be fresh. Don't get upset. Just run away. Leave. Go away where she's not next to you. This is the answer that Rav Asi got from his rabbi. So the answer to question number two, a child's not, not supposed to or should not suffer because of the parents under any circumstances. If the parents are causing the child to suffer, the child has no reason to stay there. 
He shouldn't curse, he shouldn't be upset, he shouldn't go against, he shouldn't mock, he shouldn't do anything. Shut your mouth. But turn and make a U-turn and leave. He should not. The Torah concludes by saying the child should not suffer because of the parents. And if the parents are driving the child nuts, make a U-turn and you go. So to conclude this, we have two questions that are very applicable to us and two big answers. You have to honor your parents because they gave you life at the end of the day. You want to honor them for Hakarat Atov, that's unbelievable, that's an addition. But the Torah on one side says, no, you have to honor your parents because they did to you. Your parents changed your diapers, they paid for tuition, they clothed you, they bathed you, they cared for you. Look what the parents did for you. How many times the father is working three jobs to support the family, the mother is working hard, morning to night, cooking food, folding laundry. Listen, I was thinking about it literally a few weeks ago. And I was thinking about my parents. I was like, what? Unbelievable. For 25 years. Well, I would, to be more exact, I don't know, 20 years, 22 years. How they took care of me. When I'm a little kid, that's a little thing. But when I was a teenager, oh, I cost a lot of money. I caused a lot of problems. And how they, how they tolerated me to say, the, to say it out in the open. How much they paid for me. Whatever I needed. I never suffered anything. And I was thinking about that like a few weeks ago. What a karata tov. Oh, how much I owe them. How much I owe my parents for everything that they did. There's nothing in this world that I can repay them ever. When I'm looking at myself as an observant individual, and I'm thinking I'm observant because Hashem wants me to be observant. I'm observant because I want to be close to Hashem. But I'm also doing a lot of mitzvot for the benefit of many others. I'm doing mitzvot because I know it's going to benefit Am Israel, the nation of Israel. I'm doing mitzvot because I know it's going to benefit my, my family. And a lot of times I'm doing mitzvot because I know it's going to benefit my parents. I'm, I know that. And I say to myself, even when my father is not the chief rabbi of Israel, he's an amazing man, but he's not so observant. So I'm doing a lot of mitzvot because I know one day it's going to stand as a merit for him. It says in the Talmud very, very clearly that the son is meriting the father. Whatever the son, son, girl, doesn't matter. Whatever I do affects my parents. I sometimes do mitzvot and I say I do it for my parents. How many times you dedicate a class to your parent that perished from the world? You, you support a meal? You support a, a, a shul? Over there? How, much time, how many times we do something for our parents? This is Hakarat Atov. And I came to the conclusion a few weeks ago, just a thought that was going on in my mind. I was like, how much Hakarat Atov? How much do I owe my parents? Nothing that I will do in this world will ever repay them for what they did. So I take on myself so many mitzvot and I'm saying, this is for my parents. I read Tehillim, I learn Torah, I dedicate classes. I might not say it out loud. This class is dedicated to my mom. But in my mind, I'm saying, yeah, I'm banking on mitzvot here now. I'm packing in mitzvot. One day, they, if I need to cash them out, you know, my parents used to bail me out. One day, I might have to bail them out in the heavenly court. They might call me there and say, these are your parents. Yeah. Are you vowing for them? Yeah. They fed me. They closed me, they supported me, they went through hell with me. Of course, take my mitzvot. I need to pay something, they, they're missing mitzvot, I'll give my mitzvot. So, no question here that we have to have a karat atov. no question. But the Torah is coming and also telling me, whoa, whoa, <laughs> you honor your parents because they brought life, they gave, you to, they gave you life, they brought you to the world, so what if they're horrible parents? <coughs> Excuse my language, shut up and accept it. But, nevertheless, the Torah comes and gives you a clear Cut halakha. You should not suffer because of your parents. To any cost. The parent is driving the child nuts to a point that the child is completely, cannot function. <laughs> Buy a ticket and go somewhere else. Avasi, his, his rabbi told him, move to Eretz Israel. Move away. You cannot do that. And you know what? You don't want to be in a place at chas v'shalom. You'll get upset and you'll curse. Or you'll get angry. Or you'll answer back. Shut your mouth. Just leave away. I heard a story, I don't know how real it is, but it has a very nice ending, it has a very profound message. There was once a child who he went to his final exams and he did very well. He got straight A's. His father was very wealthy. He was banking on the fact that bringing a nice report card, the father will buy him a nice car. He says, my father is wealthy, he's loaded with money, I want a nice car. Comes home with a report card, and the father is very happy, hugs him, I'm proud of you, etc. And he's waiting for the keys for the BMW. The father gives him a book of the Tanakh. You know those thick books that has the entire Tanakh in it? He gives him a little book. 
kid looks at the Tanakh, throws it. I don't want this. I wanted a car. You're full of money. I want a nice car. I did good on my exams. I'm accepting, expecting a nice, a nice present. He threw the book on the table and he left. He was so upset with the father's reaction that he decided to leave the home, left the country, and he didn't call for 20 years. He was so upset by the reaction of the father, the giving him a book instead of the car keys. Okay, 20 years passed, psh, didn't call, no messages, no cards, no nothing. At some point, he gets a letter, your father died. He gave you everything he has, you're the only child. You inherited all his fortune. He comes back into the house where he grew up, started uh, going through the stuff, opening drawers, and then he gets to the little den, the office where the father used to sit, goes through the drawers, he opened one drawer, and what does he see there? That book of Tanakh. Starts steering, takes out the book, he looks at it, and as he looks at the book, there was a little marker in the book. He opens up the book, and exactly where the marker was, whoop, a key falls down. He picks up the key and has a little tag with the date exactly where he gave, gave him the, the set for the book. The key was in the book. He just looked at the book and he threw it, not knowing the key for the car is in the, in the book. And the marker was exactly somewhere in Tanakh talking about uh, Avshalom with Kibud Aveem, with uh, respecting your parents and so forth. The point to take from that is that sometimes as kids we need to have Patience with our parents. Parents love you. Doesn't matter what you do. They love you. They give so much to you. They might not come across so soft. They might not give you what you want. They might not treat you nice. But nevertheless, they gave you a lot throughout your life. You have to sometimes know how to be patient with the parents and to wait for the day that's don't wait for the day for the parent to die and the book will open and the key comes out. Parents love usually, parents really love their kids, even if they don't come across not the right way. But they love them, they cherish them, they take care of them and so forth. So we want to take from here also a big akaratotov to our parents. And even though the parents mistreat us many, many times in many different ways, it's just something to deeply think about how much they did for us. Yeah, maybe now the situation is not the best. And maybe now the situation causes the fact that you need to turn around and move away and be away from the parent. But don't ever, ever forget what they did to you. Don't ever miss out on the, what do I need to repay them as a karata tov. So, Bezad Hashem, I hope that now that we're getting the Ten Commandments, and especially such a powerful mitzvah, where we see how important it is that it's positioned in the first five commandments, what it means to honor your parents, because when you honor your parents, you honor Hashem at the end of the day. And a person, that does, a, per, a person that doesn't honor their parents, eventually will not honor Hashem. Eventually will turn around to Hashem. I heard an unbelievable story, and I'll end with this, that uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe used to live in Russia. And then, you know, started all the pogroms and things, and the Holocaust, and he ran away with his father-in-law. His father and mother got stuck in the, I don't know exactly where it was, Russia, Ukraine, but nevertheless the father got exiled to Kazakhstan. The Lubavitcher Rebbe's father was an unbelievable Mekubal, genius in Kabbalah and Zohar. He was uh, uh, deported to Kazakhstan to labor, hard labor. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe went to Europe, to Poland, France, I don't know exactly the route, and ended up in New York. The father lived there for many, many years, I think 18 years or 20 years. His mother, who, the wife of Levi Yitzchak, went with him, devoted to him. He was in labor camp. She was outside the labor camp. She would make uh, ink from all sorts of herbs that he will have how to write his notes. And she would bring him papers of cigarette, uh, cigarette paper to write his notes. That's how we have notes. When there's no organized book. And you read his Kabbalistic interpretations of the Torah. It's unbelievable. Nevertheless, at some point he died, unfortunately he's still buried in Kazakhstan, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe's mother moved to New York. The last 17 or 18 years of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, his mother lived next to him in New York. And the story is that the Lubavitcher Rebbe used to go to her every day in his busy schedule. He would go to her, sit with her, have a cup of tea, talk to her. 
And he also requested all the students in uh, shifts to go and constantly be with her. There was shifts. The, a student will go there, if they need anything to move, to take care of. There was one individual, no need to name, name names right now, happens to be that I know him, and he gave a testimony that he never said that, not only in the life of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's mother, even after the Lubavitcher Rebbe passed, only then he said the story. And he said that one time he walked in, it was his time for the shift, and he saw the Lubavitcher Rebbe wrapping it up, and he saw the, the Rebbe like moving pictures, moving the tables, moving things around, and then walking out. And he didn't understand what's going on there. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe's mother, her name was Hana, and she told him, you know, from the day that the Lubavitcher Rebbe became 13, obligated in mitzvot, he never turned his back to me. He never turned around to me. He always walked facing me. So he didn't feel comfortable doing that because I would feel uncomfortable. She was like, he didn't never know that I knew that. The mother says about the Rebbe, he didn't know that I know that he's never turning his back to me. So when he would walk out of the house, he would pretend he's fixing the pictures, moving the tables, so he wouldn't turn his back to her. And that's how he walked out of the house. So we have to take from that how we have to cherish and value and thank our parents. Yaakov Avinu, kun du mitzvah kibuda ve'em, he was in Haran. Esav took the mitzvah, Esav did the mitzvah. How many times, we talked about it a few months ago, how Esav had the mitzvah of kibuda ve'em, that when nobody, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel said, I didn't even reach a hundredth of what Esav did in kibuda ve'em. So we want to understand how powerful this mitzvah, how much we have to value our parents, how much we have to honor them and respect them, and repay them, and how much we have to do hakarat atov. But nevertheless, we have to also understand that the Torah is also giving me an outlet. If the parents are not are mistreating you, you can turn around and go somewhere else so the parents will not go be down your, your throat, so to say. But with that, still you honor your parents and you still value them and you still respect them. Why? Because the Torah says Leman yarichun yamecha, that you gain a long, long, long life. As other Shev, we should merit to fulfill this unbelievable mitzvah of honoring our parents. It will result that we are always going to cherish, honor, and be grateful to our ultimate father, Hashem in heavens. <laughs>